Brian told me we were going to be um, in Advent today, uh, starting Advent, which a calendar could have told me too, but he wanted to, to let me know that that's what I had to do. And um, so we're going to be in Isaiah chapter um, 9 today. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I'm going to read from a couple different places, but that's where we're going to spend the bulk of our time. Um, but we're in this season of Advent, and uh, that may be new to some of us. I don't know everyone's church background, but the idea of Advent is as we approach this time of Christmas, Advent is this um, historical, um, ancient uh, practice. It comes from the Latin word um, coming. And so it's this time of anticipation. It's this time of waiting for something, uh, to patiently wait the coming of something. Um, and, we, and we just finished Thanksgiving, right? So we had Thanksgiving last week. Uh, then we had Black Friday shopping, and, and someone got in a fight in a, in a Walmart, which just doesn't feel quite like Christmas until someone gets pepper sprayed in a Walmart, right? Like that, then you know like Christmas has started and we're ready to go. Um, and so that happens, so we're ready. But, but really, uh, we kind of have seen Christmas stuff selling since as soon as Halloween was over, Right? Um, and I think some people get upset with that. They're like, I can't believe, you know, Christmas stuff's out already. I think it's, it's a really neat thing for us um, because as we think of Advent and this anticipation waiting for something, the idea of selling Christmas stuff like on November 1st just gives us a longer time to anticipate this day. Um, and it's not a bad thing. Uh, and I think it could be commercially. We could talk about whether it's a commercial thing or whatever. But it is, for us Christians, something deeper, that we anticipate this thing. Um, and the idea of Advent is something that we do annually, but it's really a, a state of our hearts all the time and all year. And so we, we celebrate, we patiently await something. Um, and we're going to talk about what that is, and then we're going to talk about the word hope. Um, and I want us to to talk about what hope means, because I feel like hope means something different biblically than the way we use it today, right? So uh, we may say something like, um, I hope the Panthers will have a good season. Um, we know that might not actually be true, but we're kind of just hoping, right? Like, man, that would be really nice if the Panthers had a good season. I hope they have one, uh, but you know what? They probably won't, right? And so um, that's our version of hope. But when we think about hope biblically, hope biblically is a moral certainty, it's this idea that this thing that I have my hope in will absolutely be true. And it's a moral certainty, not, not just a certainty, because a, certain, a hope that's just a certainty means it logically makes sense. It's, this logically is going to happen. Whatever event or person I have my hope in, logically this will come to pass. That's not what we have, because logically this stuff that we have our hope in doesn't make sense. Ours is a moral certainty where because we know the character of the one making the promise, we know that this will certainly come to pass. And that's what I want to talk about today is, is, is how we can have a hope that's a certainty, a moral certainty that this for sure will happen because of who made the promise. Right? So I have a hope that, that my and my wife's marriage will um, continue and, and we, we will, um, our marriage will continue until one of us dies. That's my hope. And, I, and I'm certain of that because I know my wife's character and I know my character and, and sure, stuff can happen, but I do have this certainty. The moral certainty we have because of God making a promise to us is even greater than that. And because there, there's a long, long history of proof for us that God, what God says will pass, will pass. Before we get into that, I want to pray for us, um, and then we will uh, chat about um, what's happening here in Isaiah 9. Father God, I thank you so much for um, your word. I thank you for this season, God, that we can kind of just set aside everything else going on in our life and just um, look at what it means to wait for something, um, to kind of slow things down and to sit in this period of waiting, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would do that in our hearts this morning, that we would just be able to slow down for a moment in a busy world that we can just see what it looks like to wait patiently. So God, I, I pray that you would be with us this morning. You would illuminate your word in such a way that we could see um, the treasures that are found in it and, and, and be with our hearts, Lord, that you would stir up a worship in us as we wait. I love you. I want to pray this in your beautiful name. Amen. <laughs> so I have a quick story. Um, in August 8th, 1950, uh, Florence Chadwick swam across the English Channel. It took her about 13 hours. Um, it's a crazy feat. I can't, I can't even like tread water for 13 seconds 
uh, but she swam for 13 hours. And then in, in 1952, she attempted um, an even greater feat. She was going to swim from Catalina Island, which is off of California, all the way to California. And, and in about 15 hours in, there, there came this dense fog where she could no longer see uh, more than like a foot ahead of her. And, and they had this boat next to her um, that had her mom in it. And, and, and it was really looking for sharks. We wanted to make sure, you know, she doesn't swim near any sharks. And so there, it's 1952, there's this dense fog, she's swimming with sharks, and, and she gets to a point after swimming for, for 15 hours where she, just, she can't do it anymore. She can't keep going. She can't see anything. Um, and she wants to give up. And her mom tells her, you're almost there. Just keep swimming. You're almost there. She swims for four more hours. And she ends up just calling and saying, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I've got to get in the boat I can't see anything, I'm cold, I'm tired. And so they pull her back in the boat, and when she gets back in the boat, they tell her, you were, you were half a mile away. You just had a little bit longer to go. And she was, she was broken about that. And she, she, you know, she, gets, she gets back on land, and she's talking to reporters, and she's like, man, I did not know I was that close. If I knew I was that close, I know I could have made it. I had half a mile left in me. But she couldn't do it. She, 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 she just didn't see. And, and so this, this dense fog rolls and she couldn't see and she didn't have this certainty of where the shore was. And so she gave up. And, and Advent is, is this time for us that I think is a little similar where we have this certainty. We know sometime the Lord is, is returning. Um, and, and, and during Advent, we kind of connect our waiting to the waiting of the prophets and of Israel where, where they were waiting a, a Messiah to come rescue them we're, we're, we're also in a period of waiting. We're waiting for that same Messiah, Jesus, to come back and bring his kingdom here forever. And so we're connecting our waiting to their waiting. And it seems like in our, in our time, and, and really the entire time, that, that, that fog rolls in and we can lose sight of that picture of that shore. And it can feel really easy. We want to give up. We don't want to do this anymore. Like, this is hard. Is Jesus ever going to come back? And we're, we wait for that moment. And, and the people of Israel did the same thing. For centuries, they had centuries and centuries and centuries, thousands of years, they had this promise that one day this thing would happen. And, and they had to wait. And they have to wait. And, and, and they waited with differing degrees of uh, patience, depending on the generation. And I think in our culture, we have differing degrees of patience as well. Uh, last night, we went to this Christmas parade, and we're watching this parade, and it was really cool. It was raining, um, and, and there's all these things. In Spruce Pine, we make a big deal about Christmas parades. It was super long, um, and it was really cool. They had fire trucks and police cars, and it was just neat. And then all these people, did. this one church, I'm not gonna, I don't want to call them out, but they had this, uh, uh, this truck and this long trailer, and they had this live nativity scene on the trailer. And everyone was dressed up, and they had hay, and they had this like barn, and they had the manger, and they had Mary, and they had shepherds, and all this stuff. Um, and then they had Joseph, and he's just sitting down behind the manger on his phone. And I was like, man, like that ruins the whole thing. Like I just can't even, he just couldn't wait. Like, like the pray was long for us, but it wasn't really long for the people, you know, like, oh man, like he couldn't just wait. And so uh, we have different patients. And I, man, I, 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 I laugh at that guy, and I was like, Lord, forgive him. He knows not what he's doing right now. Um, but I, I'm the same way. Like, I remember a time where if I wanted, I, love, I used to love going to the movies, and if I wanted to go to the movies, I couldn't just, like, Google when the movie times were. I had to call this number. I had to look up a number. I had to call a number, and it was always busy. So I had to hang up, hit redial, um, and then call again. And, and for, like, 30 minutes, I'm calling this number, and finally it's my turn. Then I have to listen to all these movie times that I don't care about just to get to the one that I do care about and hope I get it. The alternative was just actually driving to the movies and seeing the sign. And you get there, and you're like, okay, those are the times. What time is it? Okay, we can get dinner. And then if we hurry, we're going to have to go somewhere fast. We can get back. And like, So there's this, like, but now, today... If the website takes like longer than eight to 10 seconds to load, I'm just like, oh, forget it. Like this is like, I, what kind of website is this? What are the 90s? Like what is happening right now? And so like we're all this, in, this impatience, but the promise that the people of Israel had, I mean, it was a long time ago. We, we see it all the way back in Genesis chapter three, the very beginning of this story, God gives this promise to Adam and Eve after they sin and, 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 and God is telling them what's going to happen now because of your sin, that you're going to be cast out of the garden. Things are going to be tough and there's going to be um, some dark times ahead. He gives them this promise in verse 15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, talking to the serpent, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So there's this, there's this, um, there's this promise that you know, the serpent deceives 
Eve and deceives Adam, and that there's this promise that one's going to come who's going to destroy you. You're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. The snake crusher is coming to rescue his people. There's this promise, and it's not thousands and thousands of years later until that actually takes place. But he continues to, to kind of narrow down this promise. In Genesis 12, he tells Abraham, or he tells Abram, who would become Abraham, the father of the nation of Israel, he says, I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And he's telling him, like, through your offspring, and, and later we find out in Galatians that what he, who he was specifically talking about was Jesus, Abraham's offspring. That through Jesus, all of the earth would be blessed. That there was coming a time, and he, and he continues this promise. He tells, he tells people that through the line of David, that one's going to come. And we see in, in the genealogies of Christ that, that Jesus comes from the line of David. So there's these promises made. In fact, uh, and later in Genesis, he gives a promise that a king's going to come and, and rule forever. And, and they didn't even have kings yet. Israel didn't even have, like, they weren't even a nation that had kings. But he's making this promise of one's going to come. And they had to wait thousands of years for that promise to come. And then we get to Isaiah chapter 9. And we're going to read uh, starting in chap uh, verses 1 through 7. And it says this, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of, of Nephtali. But in the latter time he made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the, uh, the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. And so... Um, there's this, the, the Galilee is where Jesus did uh, most of his earthly ministry. And so he's talking about that, that area where Jesus does most of his earthly ministry. He doesn't know that yet. It was going to be made glorious. The people who, verse 2, who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy in, at the harvest as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden, the staff is his sh of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. So there's this, there's this area in northern, northern Israel, in Galilee, um, this is where all the nations would come in to attack and take over Israel. So this was a lot of fighting going on in this area. When, when nations were going to come and attack Israel, this is the way they were coming. So this place has seen a lot of blood, a lot of uh, war, a lot of people dying, a lot of pillaging and taking of people happening in this area. And so he's talking about you know, the, the tramping of warrior, the, the blood being spilled. All these things is, is, is a part of this one area's history. But then in verse 6, he turns and says, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and, and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And so there's a few things for us to consider here, and I think, I think the one big thing we see here is there's this turn for the first time in prophetic history um, that, that we're, we're seeing this promise made to Adam and Eve and a promise made to Abraham and a promise made to his kids. There's this promise that goes, and for the first time, the promise is made more clear that this promise isn't just that there's someone going to come and redeem you. There's not just someone's going to come and make things right. It's not just that so anyone's going to come. It, it's that God himself is going to come. That mighty God, everlasting Father, God himself. And so there's this turn here in, in prophetic literature where, where we, don't, we know now it's not just anybody who's going to come, but that God himself is going to come. That there, there's this Savior is our wonderful counselor, our mighty God. Wonderful counselor, um, I think oftentimes we think of as um, uh, like someone like, you know, in a counseling session, like a a therapist or something. And, and really when we think about counselor and what it means in this context um, is, is a king would have counselors, people who would give him wisdom and, and, and help fight battles and help uh, keep the kingdom. And so when we think about wonderful counselor, we, we can kind of have that image of someone who's this inexhaustible source of wisdom. 
Someone who's able to give us wisdom, this supernatural source, which is amazing news for those of us who need guidance. We have this mighty God that indicates that Jesus will be strong and powerful, amazing news for those of us who are weak. Everlasting Father is not, I'm glad we, maybe it was providential this morning that we read that the Son is not the Father because this could be confusing for us that Jesus would be called Everlasting Father. But Jesus, the idea here is not that he's replacing the Father, but that he is going to come and display the Father's attributes as a human, that he's going to care for us like a father would. He's going to be good to us like a father would care and be good for his children. It's amazing news for those of us who feel alone and worthless. And then he's the Prince of Peace, and Jesus is going to bring um, deep well-being and peace to restore relationships, primarily those between us and God. And then Isaiah 53, you don't have to turn there, um, but you can if you want. I don't think I gave it to Brian, so it's probably not going to be up here. But it's Isaiah 53, it starts in uh, verse 1. This is, kind of tells us how this is going to happen. How is this wonderful counselor, this mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, how is he going to do all this? Isaiah says, who has believed that he has heard from what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and his wounds, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people... And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. That's, that's you and me. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, that's Jesus, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Now, why, why is this all important? Why, why are we talking about this on Christmas? It's because this is what really matters, and this is what really fixes all the, the things that we feel are wrong. Well, like, like, I think we all can agree, if we could just sit down and talk, that something's gone wrong in this world. Amen? Like something, like things just aren't quite right. We get glimpses of like, hey, there's, man, like and the things are moving in a good direction, and, and this seems like this is going to be good, but just something's gone wrong in this world, and, and we're unable to fix it. Like, we can't do it. We cannot crush the head of the devil. There's nothing in us that can do that, and we can't be the kind of blessing to the world and to our family that Abraham, was, that was promised to Abraham. We can't do that. I try so hard to, to bless my kids, and it most often backfires, Right? Like, I love my kids, and I try to say yes as much as possible because there's so many things I'm going to have to say no to. I want to make those count. Um, and so we say yes to a lot of things. Um, and, and then what we're, what we're met with oftentimes is some sort of entitlement or that's mine. Um, my son, my youngest son, who's like one, almost turning two, he's turning two in two weeks. 
Um, he, last night, we, we do this like uh, trail of lights in Spruce Pine where we're going around seeing all these lights. And for whatever reason, every light he sees, he just goes, mine, mine, <laughs> mine. I'm like, like how, why do you even think that? Like, it's so weird. Like, like we're trying to take you on this thing. We try to have this big surprise. Like, hey, we're going to go. We're going to go see all these lights. And you know what my daughter says halfway through this? This isn't a good surprise. And I'm like, we got to pray. Like, just pray for her soul. Like, I don't know what <laughs> is wrong with her. But like, I, we try to be this blessing to our family and we just can't do it. We can't bring the, the kind of things we need in this world. Like we can't bring peace to this world, right? Like, like actual, like if you just think like wartime, like we can't bring peace. Like what? World War I was supposed to be the war that would end all wars, right? And then, and then what happens after? World War II, Right? And it's not, as soon as World War II ends, and then we're in a Cold War. And then we're in Korea, and right? It's in Korea, and then we're in, in Vietnam, and then we're in the Middle East, and then we're back in the Middle East. And like, just war, like we can't, all these things are supposed to bring peace, and, and they just seem to not bring peace. And we don't need to argue about whether these were good things or bad things, but the, the result, I think we all can agree on, is they have not brought peace. It goes from one war to the next. Maybe it's good, maybe it's not, but it has not brought peace. See, we can't fix what's wrong in this world. The, the people of Israel couldn't do it. They had to wait for someone to come. They had to wait for Jesus to come and, and, and bear the transgressions of his people, to bear the sin of his people, to take that sin away. They had to wait for that. And they waited, again, with varying degrees of patience and certainty. But he did come. And in the same way, we need to wait and be patient that Jesus is coming, that we cannot fix this by ourselves, that we need him. And the good news about us waiting is that he's doing stuff while we wait. Like the waiting should change, like us knowing for sure Jesus is going to come back and fix all that's wrong with this world. What should change the way we live today and not make us apathetic because we know that, that it's coming someday, so I don't have to do anything today. Someday it's going to be all just fixed. But it should be, we've been invited in to help get it as close as we can, and then someday he's going to come and just finish it. And it should change. But, but we have to realize first, and, and, and I think this may be weird for us during Christmas, but the first part of our hope is we kind of have to sit in the darkness of we can't do it. And that there, there, there almost is no hope for us in ourselves. We have to sit in that. And then if we can sit in that for a moment, that there's no hope within us, then we can see the hope that is in Christ. The hope that is in Christ and his first coming that saves us, and the hope that is in Christ and his second coming where we get to be with him forever. See, when Jesus first came, he, he brought this light and it, and it began to pierce the darkness. And so now he's left us, his church, and we are a light in the darkness. But when Jesus comes again, there's just going to be light and no more darkness. And that's incredible news, right? Like this is, this is news like our world wants to hear. Like, like think about our world for a moment. Like, like our world cries out for justice, right? Like we want like human trafficking and, and all these things to end and Jesus hates injustice. And not only does he want that to end, he has promised that he will come and he will end it. If you want to end murder, Jesus is going to come back and put to death all death. If you want to end things like, like racism and hate, Jesus is going to come back and get rid of all hate and all anger. Like the news that we have about Advent and our waiting for Jesus' second coming is the news our world desperately wants to hear. Now, I'm not naive enough to think they're going to hear it, but God has called people to himself who are ready and willing to hear that news. So today, this morning, the hope that we have is for us, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know your story or where you are or what's going on in your life, but the fact that Jesus is coming again, that he came as a baby and he's coming again as a king, like that's good news for us. 
whatever you're going through, whether it's, because Christmas time can be sad sometimes, right? Because we, we start Christmas time and we kind of watch these commercials and it gives us this idea of like, okay, our family's going to come over and everyone's going to be smiling and laughing and, and uh, we're going to cut into that ham and it's going to be perfect and it's going to be warm. Everything's going to come out of the oven at the same time, some, magically somehow, and everything's going to be warm and, and no one's going to yell, no one's screaming at each other, no one's throwing Monopoly or, or puzzles across the room. Like everything's going to be beautiful. And maybe that happens for some of us for, for a day, but then it goes back to our, like our, there's still issues in our family. There's still brokenness in our family. There's still brokenness in our world. Like, so like Christmas can, can, can kind of sell us this story that we buy into and like, okay, this is, what, this, is what, this is what this is about. This is what this is going to be. And we can miss what's really worth celebrating is that even when those things aren't, real, even when we've missed those things, when our family is broken at Christmas, where things are tough, where things do look dark, the light has come. And he'll pierce that darkness. And then someday he'll come back and make it all light and no more darkness. And so this is for us, but then we take this hope and we share it with others. Because again, like our world wants to hear this. Now they're not going to, but so many people will. And so we have to share it liberally with all people and call them to the, there's something greater at Christmas, something greater going on than just the lights and the tinsel and the trees. And I love those things. I'm no Scrooge. Like I'm playing Christmas music since November 1st. Like I'm all about it. I'm into it. I love it. Um, Day after Thanksgiving, I, I played football on Thanksgiving my brother-in-law started this new tradition of playing uh, a turkey bowl. Um, I'm not very athletic, so um, I just kind of stood around out there. But I moved, and I got hurt and sore, and, um, but I wanted the lights up. My wife wanted the lights up. Uh, I kind of grumbled about it because of how sore I was, but I got up the ladder and down the ladder and up the ladder. Like, I'm all about the lights, the Christmas. Like, I'm all about all, the, all this part of it. But there's something deeper going on than just the lights, Something deeper going on than just the tree and the smells and the hot cocoa. And we get to share that because we know what it is. And people long for something deeper. And so we share that with the world. And so um, don't let the idea that we're waiting make us wait apathetically. We have a hope that changes us. We have a hope that drives us to go out and, and share that and help transform our communities, help to transform families, help to transform the 828. And, and so we get to go out and be a part of Jesus bringing in his kingdom. And so we have this hope that we have a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, a prince of peace who's going to bring a kingdom that will never end, that will be established forever. And the invitation to all is to see that there's no hope in ourselves, to repent of our sins and to come to him and be, in part, to, uh, be a part of his kingdom, to be a part of his family that he's creating. And that's the invitation. And, 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 and this is what we're called into. And this is what we call others into. And that's our certainty. It's twofold. It's one that Jesus has come as a baby. He drew his first breath in a manger or near a manger. But he has not said his final words yet. That he will return, this time not as a baby, but he will come back with a tattoo on his thigh, a, a sword protruding from his mouth, to set up his kingdom forever. And this is incredible news for us. And so this is what we celebrate in Advent. This is what we patiently wait for. In the summer of 1952, two months after Florence Chadwick failed to swim from Catalina to California, she set off to swim again. And this time she made it. She swam the distance. The fog was no less thick that day than it was two months earlier. 
when she got to the shore, people asked, like, hey, what was different this time? Well, how, why did you make it this time when you couldn't last time? It's only been two months. Like, there's not a lot of training, like, you can do after resting from that kind of swim. And, and then in two months, and her response was, this time, I just kept the picture of the shore in my mind the entire time. Like, I knew that it was there. I knew that it was coming. And if I just kept going, I would reach it. So no matter how thick the fog rolls into our life, if we could just keep the picture from Revelation 19 through 21, just keep that picture in our mind that Jesus is coming back, that he's going to make all sad things untrue, that he's going to, res- he's going to restore the earth and his people. And, and really, if you read it, it's not just even restoring, it's actually making it better, better than it ever has been. Better than even the, what, the garden we think is this perfect thing that could have no improvement. But whatever Jesus is bringing back at the end is going to be even better than that, he tells us. And so if we can keep that picture in our mind, whatever comes into our life, these things that try and tear away from our hope that, you know, this isn't going to change or this isn't going to be real. Like we, if we can keep that in our mind, we can keep going through um, what could be painful holidays for some of us. Thanksgiving and Christmas, what could be painful seasons for us, if we can keep that, not even just during the season of Advent, but keep that picture in our mind that Jesus for sure will come, that we know the end of this story, that we know what's what's happening. We know, we don't know how long it's going to be, but it's certainly closer now than it was when we started this worship gathering, right? It's closer now than it was this morning. And so if we can keep that, that man, every minute that goes by, every moment that passes by, we're closer to that end that we want so bad, man, we can have hope. We can have a, a moral certainty that that will come to pass and that will absolutely change who we are today and it will change how we interact with our, in our relationships around us. And, so, and that's really my prayer this morning for Advent is that we would see and picture Jesus' second coming and that would be our hope. That if, if a God who promised for thousands of years he would send a savior to save his people and to rescue his people, if a God who said that for thousands of years did it, then if he says he's coming back, he will. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to guess, like, is this really true? I mean, he promised, and we can, we can go into the um, historical documents and all this stuff, but there's, I mean, for thousands of years, there was prophecies made about Jesus that all came true in his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And if he said he was going to be born, and he was, and he said he was going to live a certain way, and he did, and he was going to die a certain way, and he did, and he was going to rise again a certain way, and he did, then if it says he will come back, then he will. And we can be certain of that. And not just hope it's going to happen like we hope the Panthers will do well, but we can know it's going to happen. We can have a hope that is like an anchor for us that will keep us still when things try to topple us. It can be that picture of the shore that we can have in our mind that no matter how thick the fog gets, we can keep going. We don't have to give up. We don't have to slow down. We can keep going. The day is coming soon where we'll reach that shore and the old will pass away and the new will come. And so as we ponder that today, as we look forward to that day and we, we think about all that means for us, I just want to leave you with two things and then we'll, we'll pray and respond. <clears throat> the first thing is to really let that sink in for yourself, as I said. Let that sink in and, and what does this hope mean for me? How could that kind of hope, what is that going to change about my life? I know many of you guys probably already knew, I didn't say anything super shocking to you today. But how can that hope that for sure Jesus is going to return, how does that change how you live today? I'm not going to tell you. I want you to work that out and figure out what does that change today? And then then if I have a hope and I have a certainty that my world longs to hear, how can I share that with others? How can I share that with my, let's start with our family. How can I share that with my family? If you have kids and you have a spouse, like what does it look like for us as a family to practice this waiting and to be reminded of this hope and have this thing to look forward to? 
Tonight, me and, me and my kids, we're going to read a little bit from the Jesus Storybook Bible. We're going to light our own Advent candle, um, and, and we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about Jesus and his, his first coming, his second coming. Uh, but then one thing I want to do is I want my kids to practice waiting and looking forward to something. So we're going to tell them, this is free for you guys. It's not my idea. I found it on the internet. Internet's awesome most of the time, sometimes, a little bit of the time. And, um, uh, and you, so, but this idea that hey, I'm going to tell my kids, hey, <clears throat> sometime this week later, we're going to do something awesome. It's going to be so much fun. And I can't wait to do it with you guys. And just let that be it. And then every night be like, hey guys, like, remember we're going to do this thing and we're going to, or it's going to be so, so much fun. I can't wait. I, I, we haven't decided what it's going to be yet. We'll decide before tonight so we're not lying to them. We want to make sure it is awesome. But like, it could be making cookies. It certainly won't be going down the, light of tr- the, tr- the, the trail of lights again because she hated that. Um, <clears throat> but it'll be something that they will all love. And I want to just like instill in this, this practice of looking forward to something and then knowing for sure that thing's going to come. Now, look, Something could happen in our family. Maybe that doesn't come. I, th- I hope they'll forget about it and forgive us if like, something crazy happens. But we're going to make sure we do something fun this week. And, and so think about, okay, I have this hope. What does it look like for me to share this hope with my family? What does it, share, what does it look like for me to share that hope with the other people I interact with regularly? Whether that's at work or at, the, at you know, your favorite coffee place you go to or school or wherever you go, what does it look like to share this certainty that you have with those around you. In just a moment, I'm going to pray, and then you guys will have a chance to respond uh, through communion. And uh, man, this is an awesome uh, opportunity during Advent, especially, because part, kind of built into the idea of communion in the Lord's Supper is this idea of anticipation and waiting. Because when Jesus instituted the Last Supper, he said, I'm not going to do this again until I'm with you in heaven. And so we take communion and we, we take it, we take the Lord's Supper to remind us of what Christ has done on the cross for us. That, he, that his blood was spilt for us and so we take the cup and we drink wine or juice or whatever you guys do and, and we take the bread and, and, and we break it and it's to remind us that blood was spilt to make us anew. That a body was broken, Jesus' body was broken for our sins. That though we deserve that punishment, Jesus took it on our behalf for all who would believe. But Jesus also said, I'm not going to take this anymore until I take it again with you someday in heaven. And so we take this today to remember, but also as a, a shadow of what's to come later. That someday we will take this meal with Jesus face to face. Not just in remembrance, but as a celebration of his kingdom.